Like I literally am roaming around the church. Hello? 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 person who's able to talk about anything regarding race. Let's go into the future. Let's keep perpetuating the 70s. Yeah, I realized that. You were doing this too, or is it just me? I'm just doing the intro. Okay, that's what I thought. I meant to be supposed to do Well, I, I'm <laughs> guessing it's supposed to be me, but. I you want to do it? I got cornered. Okay. You'll do a better job than me. I don't know about that. I hate doing intros. It makes me feel bad. Well, I'll be looking at you.
to point it out or anything. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
great events coming up um, before we end up at Tempe Bay Beast to show up. So, um, one of the ways to kick that off is to have Vanessa German here. And the way that that came about was a graduate student last year had suggested, had seen her work and suggested that we invite her here in relation to one of our questions, which is how we go about figuring out our programming each year. And one of that, that question was, how, <clears throat> how and why do we fix things? And some of the work that Vanessa does personally in her studio and also her community work really speaks to some of those things. And so we're really excited to have her here. Um, and we're really excited to have you here and listen to her and her work. Um, and we hope you just, that you enjoy. It will go for about 45 minutes to an hour and then there will be time for questions and answers. Without further ado, we'd like to welcome Vanessa Sherman. Space 
and we're gonna talk about the work. So this is the cycle and the balance of my life and my process. Um, I believe in the power of love. I define love as creative, understanding, redemptive, transformative, good will. Uh, and I'll talk about how I activate that in studio, in heart, in spirit, in relationship to uh, where I live, which is next, and how I am alive, where I live and what the work is. And by the work, I mean the product of the time and the product of the breath and action and materials, but I also mean um, the work as in, why do my lungs work? Like why, why uh, did, did my lungs open to breathe, to be here now? Like what is the work of my life? I'm thinking about those things the same time. Uh, the center of the cycle for me is art. This is my front porch uh, at a, a house that I have in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh called Homewood. I'm from Los Angeles. I grew up in LA. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Left Milwaukee when I was about six months old. Uh, grew up in Los Angeles till I was 14. My father's company was bought by Heinz and they moved my father's company to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and I've lived in Pittsburgh. Um, uh, they moved my father's company to Cincinnati and then they moved the company to Pittsburgh and I live in Pittsburgh now. The center of the cycle is art for me and uh, this is a uh, this is the first work of art that I made in an in incarnation that, uh, of sculptural work that I'm sort of known for now. I create contemporary power figures. I am a self-taught artist, and what that means for me is I learn from anyone and everyone, anywhere that I can, and I value that. I value people's experiences. I value my own experiences. I have no college degree, and I value that too. But I also value the fact that some of you are studying art. I think in the world that we live in, for you to decide to go to school, to dedicate the time of your life to being creative is brave. So I respect that, but I was mostly taught to be an artist um, in a way that wasn't teaching at all, in a way that was how, in a way that was um, the ingredients to living that my mother gave us in Los Angeles to keep us alive. I grew up in Los Angeles in uh, the 1980s, so two things really stand out to me about growing up in Los Angeles. Um, uh, one uh, is AIDS. I grew up when AIDS was not called AIDS, it was like gay fever, and I remember watching people in my neighborhood disappear. I remember the man next door, the beautiful man next door who always had his nails done, and I remember watching him get thinner and thinner and then noticing that I could see his cheekbones really well and waking up one night at like one o'clock in the morning and seeing the cherry lights of an ambulance and watching them take him away and that he never came back to the street. I lived across the street from gay and lesbian adolescent social services. So as an eight, nine, 10, 11 year old, I knew 14 year olds who were HIV positive. My vice principal of my school got pneumonia and died over the weekend. And we found out later that it was AIDS. So um, between people dying of AIDS and street death, um, I grew up really afraid that I was gonna die young. And since I, and that was an active fear. I watched two girls uh, got shot outside of a liquor store. Anybody here from Los Angeles? You know about liquor stores? <laughs> <laughs> Some pals, we're not going to want that. So uh, I watched these two girls who went to go get milk, get caught up in a drive-by shooting, and get shot and killed. And the milk cartons got shot when they got shot, because I remember uh, blood and milk on the sidewalk. And I never forgot that I was afraid. And they looked like me and my sisters. And I was always afraid that something would happen to us. And so I decided as a really young kid that um, one of the things I did is I walked around and I asked all the adults who would like listen to me. And people were always calling me. When I was a kid, people would always say that I was uh, obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> and adults would be like, why are you asking adults questions like that? Because I would always ask adults 
what they regretted. <laughs> I did, and like grow, which, which I realize now is one of those questions that I, and, and you probably know kids like this in your life. Kids who basically look like the Buddha, they look at you and they look like they know all of your secrets. And you're like, oh my God, get this child away from me. I'm, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I just wanna, you just wanna start telling me. So I, would, so I would look at people and be like, so what? So you're a grown up, like what do you regret? What do you wish you had done differently? And one of the things that adults kept saying is that they, that there was something they wish they did that they didn't do. And I was like, oh, I'm not gonna make that mistake because if I get taken out when I'm 12, I'm gonna have done the things that I wanna do. I'm not gonna make it to 57 and be like, daddy was a dentist, so I became a dentist, but I really wanted to be a dancer. And then like, <laughs> well, I'm gonna dance then. So um, I was really afraid that I'd get taken out. And one of the ways that my mother kept us alive um, at that time, uh, because I grew up I went to school in Compton. Like we knew Easy E before, you know, somebody taught him to rap. <laughs> um, and there were it was a scary but also really seductive world. And so my mother, to keep us alive, would put our supplies all over the dining room table, and she would make us make stuff. Anything that we wanted, she'd make us make it. You know, which is horrifying when you're a kid in Los Angeles. I went to Los Angeles Center for Rich Studies. I went to school with Leonardo DiCaprio. I went to school with like the parents who designed guest jeans and stuff. And you always wanted to look fresh and fly. My mother's like, if you want guest jeans, go ahead. Get that denim and get that pattern, cut it out. Cut, out, cut yourself out a little triangle <laughs> and hand stitch it <laughs> to the back. I mean, it was, and we would try. And I remember getting made fun of and kids would be like, you painted that Nike swoosh on there. And I'd be like, but that, it still counts. <laughs> it still counts. And they were like, um, you broke ashy and dirty. <laughs> um, but my mother would make us make stuff. And so we would make our clothes and we'd make our toys and we'd make books. And one of the things that I understood was that you make your life. You do not outsource. Use what you have, and you do stuff with it, and the time that you spend doing with it, you're gonna eat and laugh and be with your family, and that's how you make a life. Uh, so this piece, Power, is called Power for You to Keep Me Alive. It's currently in Progressive's collection. Y'all know about Progressive Insurance Contemporary Art Collection? Progressive has the top contemporary, corporate contemporary art collection in the country. If you work at that call center in Cleveland, it's like working in the greatest contemporary art museum. <coughs> Because the woman, his wife, loves art. And so you walk in there, and it's like poor Carrie James Marshall. I mean, the place is filled. It's filled with art. And if you have a cubicle with a wall, and you want a piece of art, they give you a notebook. And you can choose a work of art to be in your workspace. Like, I remember walking through Paulson, and there was a uh, Leonardo Drew on the wall, and a Kara Walker, and I was like, so wait. This woman has managed to like thoroughly enmesh her love for art into uh, like really the only place she can with a collection like that. So this is in that collection. It's called Power Figure to Keep Me Alive. I have seriously attempted suicide three times in my life. The last time I was trying, gonna kill myself, I had learned something from my friend whose son sat in a chair and just died. I realized that you didn't have to like take a bunch of pills or shoot yourself, that you could will yourself to death. And that was like a really dangerous understanding for me. Uh, and I believed it thoroughly that I could just sit in a chair and die. But at the time, I was seeing a lot of bumper stickers that said there's power in art. And I was like, this is not 1964. This is like all hippie stuff. Um, and I had listened to Lauren Hill's Unplugged, and she said that she started to treat elements of her life as though she was a scientist, that she was the experiment, she was the material, she was a scientist. And so, you know, I was like, I'm going to try that. If there's power in art, I'm going to see what it is. And I was so depressed. And any of you who have been depressed, you know that commercial, when that commercial says, where does depression hurt? Everywhere. It's just a true thing. And how the, the way that it, that it weighs on you, it makes it terribly difficult to get out of the bed and move. Like your limbs are in sand and water. Um, but it takes a great feat to do that. And so what I did every day, my scientific experiment was to see if there was power in art. I did two things, well three things. I ate, I walked my dog, and I would 
go down to my damp Pittsburgh basement with no windows except a small air vent. And I gave myself full permission to do whatever I wanted to do. How many of y'all do that? How many of you are artists and you, do you know, every once in a while you're working on a project for class and you just do whatever you want to do. Right? How will, how exactly? Freedom. Powerful. And so I did whatever I wanted to do. I let myself touch whatever I wanted to touch. And, and I, um, you know, I wasn't around people who were training artists in a certain way. And I sort of felt corny and bad that I wanted to, like, take dolls apart. And I, I live around a lot of abandoned houses, so I would take my dog and we would walk into these abandoned houses. And sometimes you would see a house that an old woman had died in and, and, and maybe the porch collapsed, so you'd have to climb over something to get in the house. The, the dining rooms would be frozen. An entire dining room cabinet filled with, you know, the white plates that she collected. And I would find these sort of frozen scenes. And um, if any of you watch the horrible little mini documentary about me called It's out there. And <laughs> you'll see in that documentary the, the filmmaker um, following me into a house. So you can see some of that. That is available. Um, but I would, I let myself be drawn to whatever objects and whatever materials that I felt like. That's just what I did. I touched what I wanted to touch. I brought it home. I started stacking wood and taking things apart and doing things that were, took tedious, meticulous amounts of time, like, like picking up all the weave hair from the neighborhood and then making, uh, taking the sheet of music, the man, y'all know Billy Strayhorn? Yeah. Billy Strayhorn's piano teacher lived across the street from me in Homewood. And uh, Miss Charlotte had a, has a son named uh, Reginald Plato, who was a piano prodigy. And people wrote about him and stuff, but when he was 13, he had a nervous breakdown and was institutionalized. And he, we still see him around the neighborhood. He looks like Frederick Douglass a little bit. But he started to hoard music. And when they demolished the house, sheet music spread around the street. So I'd pick up the street music and the weave hair and the seeds from the trees at home. And I would try to make physical the grief that I had. And I felt like I was suffering this grief that was not mine. I felt like I hadn't lived a life that um, had earned the sort of weight that I was carried with me. So I tried to make a physical object to put it in to honor that grief and to honor that deep, deep blue place. Um, but then I would tediously see feet by seat these deep faces. And I found that something was happening to me in the actual process time. I found that my mind would clarify that I was able to, without judgment and without fear, look at my own thoughts and almost turn them scientifically 360 degrees around and investigate what was happening inside of my soul. And those of you who are artists or writers, you have that feeling, right? When you go into the thing, it's like you become the thing itself. That is an old feeling. That is as original as your humanity. It's why, you know, some monks move piece of rice by piece of rice, by piece of rice, to make a picture because something is happening to you in that physical, spiritual, and intellectual place. And I believe in that place. I believe in going there. I believe in seeing what happens. I believe that it's medicinal. medicinal. Um, I just came, I spent a lot of time in Cannonball, North Dakota last year in Standing Rock, and I would see it happening. Ryan, did anybody go to Standing Rock? Okay, so I was about to say we've been about to have community and discuss the sacred fire and what happened there. Uh, so this piece showed me that. It showed me, for me, what the power of art was. And I thought to myself, then I can attend to anything if I have this. There's nothing that can break me anymore. There's no one that can break me. There's nothing that can impress me anymore because I found I found it, a um, power figure to keep me alive. So I make the contemporary power figure you just saw. I shoot a photo series, some of them are here. It's called The Blacks, and it's 
started as an act of uh, intentional and strategic act of misery resistance uh, during the election campaign. <clears throat> and I noticed that uh, myself and a lot of the women of color around me were expressing, I had a friend try to kill herself, would have never thought it. Would have never thought, she had five kids. And I was like, something's happened to us. And the women were expressing a kind of sorrow and a kind of rage blending with sorrow and depression. And so what I started to do is I'd be like, hey, you want to come over? Let me put a wig on you. And I'm going to do your makeup. I just, just, just trust me. You're the so I just need you to have faith in our time together because we are so sad. Let's just play and have fun and walk around our neighborhood and look beautiful and, and have a caravan of children fall. Just trust me. <laughs> and so they would trust me. And what happens is I would, uh, I would make jewelry and make clothes and I would take this model out into the street in Homewood and kids would follow us around. People would stop their cars and take pictures with their cell phones and say, I've never seen anything like that here. It's just so beautiful. Um, she's like, I had one kid who swore that one of the models was the most beautiful woman he ever saw. He was like totally stupefied by her. It was really cool. Um, so I shoot the blacks, and I call it the blacks because there's that think tank in Chicago. And that young um, white female scholar who, uh, we've seen her on Fox News and everything, I forget her name right now, um, but on the Diane Reed show, they were talking about violence in Chicago, and she kept using the phrase, the blacks. She was saying, um, it's that the blacks are sick. If the blacks weren't so sick, this wouldn't be happening in their neighborhoods. This is the blacks' problem. And if the blacks get together, they can handle it. The blacks don't want anybody's help. And nobody else on the panel stopped her from doing that. I was like, you know, most people on the globe are black people, right? Because you just loving everybody, everybody together. We all up living. All, all black people live on the south side of Chicago. And so uh, I created this photo series called The Black. So if you Google The Black, you come up with like black people as superheroes in the photo series. Oh. Um, Can I come? I'm so sorry. No, you don't have to be okay. sorry. I told you. Oh, you I'm not sorry. sorry. <laughs> I, I wanted, before you move forward. You and she taking so many notes, y'all. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not very interested. She's a novelist. <laughs> yeah, I'm very interested. You're beautiful. I'm an artist, too. You're cool. You're cool. I'm very inspired. Um, I wanted to know if the photograph in the, the tower figure to help you survive was a family <coughs> member or somebody that you know, oh. or just who, who was that? Person? You know, my friend who has um, issues with crack told me that for $2. He sold me an entire photo album filled with images of black people in Pittsburgh beginning in 1899. <coughs> Names on the back, dates. And so I photocopied them and I used them. They are, you know, sometimes you see a first name. There's one, um, um, there's one in there with a little girl with one arm, a little black girl with one arm. And on the back it says, sorry I ain't as pretty as so and so. Like there's a name and it sort of falls off. And I was like, wow, this is this one armed three year old, and there's an apology for her presence on the back of this photograph. And I use it over and over again, and I store that photograph. That's the lone photograph I store in the book, The Illuminated Rumi. Have you seen that book? Have anybody seen the book, The Illuminated Rumi? You like Rumi? Who here likes Rumi? Poems. My favorite Rumi poem is Out Beyond Ideas of Wrongdoing and Right Doing, There is a Field. I will meet you there. <laughs> this is Zoe. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm making pictures. But I'm also making um, sort of intentional encounters with them as we walk around the neighborhood. Um, and sometimes I like hire one of the high school kids to be my assistant. I just want them to be there. I want them to have the opportunity to feel that, to feel something different. Sometimes if I, uh, I don't make singular, discrete works of art anymore like this. 
uh, and I'll show you what, what new work is for me. Um, but when I did, I would take them on the bus, take a small work of art and sit it on the bus next to me because I found that the best artist pops actually just happen at your fence or they happen with people who didn't study art history. And so I would put pieces on the bus and I would, people would get on the bus and they would double take and be like, whoa. And the adults would always be like, is that voodoo? <laughs> you voodooing somebody? <laughs> but they would all, people would sit around me and we would all start to have these amazing conversations. And it wouldn't always be about voodoo. Sometimes we'd just go, you know, they would whine, but we would get a chance to have this human moment of curiosity and interest um, that is rare sometimes, you know, to have, because people would just start talking together. I think it looks like this. I think it, can I take a picture with it? And so I take them on the street corners and this photograph is called Gun with the Wind. Uh, so this is part of new work for me. This work is, anybody have any questions? artist last year, I was Matrix Artist 174. I live in Pittsburgh right now. Andy Warhol was Matrix Artist number seven. Uh, so I was, you know, this exhibition, I think there's a Matrix in Berkeley now, and there's the original one, which is at the Wadsworth Ethne in Connecticut, and I made an army of 31 black female power figures installed in a long tunnel-like space uh, with earthen walls and a 15-layer soundtrack and subwoofers and bitches that you sit in when you come into the space. Um, inspired visually by the sort of stunning, the, uh, the stunning spectacle of the terracotta army and also the sort of magic that it was uh, men working in a field to dig a well who found it. And also the magic of there being all these extra caverns that they can't open because when they opened one of them, the paint was visible and then it all disappeared when it hit the air so they closed it up. Um, so thinking about magic and thinking about power and thinking about the world that we live in and um, the fact that my mother grew up in the 60s was one of the young people at the University of Wisconsin on Black Thursday that the police uh, chained together and put in the back of the van. My mother was one of those kids. So you can find her oral history online. My mother um, met Dr. King, marched with Dr. King, did all these things, and found that the way she was going to raise her children was to be activists and artists. There's an old picture of me in the Los Angeles Times um, Ronald Reagan is coming into town, and I'm like five years old holding a sign that says U.S. out of El Salvador. Yeah. And I would stand in the middle of this, this uh, circle of protesters yelling like all these slogans. Uh, but my, I thought that it was really interesting. My mother died two years ago, um, and my parents never were like, get good grades, go to college, get a scholarship. Um, they were like, you're going, my mother um, would always say, you're going to have to figure that out. I was like, how, how do you become the student? She's like, you're gonna have to figure that out. You're gonna have to ask questions. And so from a very young age, my mother empowered us with the power of questions. The bumper sticker on my mom's car said, question authority. And I, was, I almost got kicked out of school when I got in trouble for something. I just kept questioning them when I got in. And they were like, who do you think you are? Asking out this question. It's like, you're, uh, you're seven. <laughs> No, for real, I was I was at I was at Figueroa Street School in Compton, and my mother had to come in, and they were like, "Why do you keep asking these questions?" I said, "Because my mother says you can question authority." Um, and so then, if that if my mother lived this whole life, um, you know, born in Louisiana, married to my dad, whose uh, whose uncles had to cut a, their lynched brother out of a tree, and that the way that she saw fit. You know, my mother had multiple master's degrees. The way that she saw fit to prepare us for the world that, that is around us was to make us questioners, activists, and artists. So then I'm like, what can art do? Like, I, I know what it can do for me. What else can I, can I beseech it to attend to? 
Uh, and so the army is called, I come to do violence to the lie. Because uh, there's the quote that you, uh, you could kill the people who lie about you. You could kill liars every day of the week, but it don't kill the lie. To kill the lie, you must consume the lie with the truth. The truth must be so clear and so potent that nothing else can exist in the face of it. I come to do violence to the lie. Each one of the figures in the army is a weapon in and of itself. Like an AK-47 does not need to hold an AK-47. It's the thing itself. The figure itself is the weapon. And by sight, in um, what I call like there's the ri a, a riddle of sight, that if you see um, an object next to another object, then your brain is going to try to like make a relationship between those. And then you're gonna keep trying to follow it all over the thing. Um, but if you do that in a certain way, it'll put you in a trance. Uh, and so like, um, and we'll see some of this in my new work, I love the idea from Haitian voodoo flag that you can be dazzled into a trance. And in that trance-like state, you can then attend to issues. You can then attend with almost, um, you can attend with, with uh, powers that defy the laws of physics to attend to things. Uh, so each figure in and of itself is a weapon. This one is also holding a weapon. Some of them are holding knives and they're holding daggers, uh, but they're to, uh, there to cut certain things. Because for you to be dazzled into a trance, then you need to be released from the idea that it's impossible. So we have to cut the idea that you know everything. We're cutting the idea that uh, some people have that, they're, that everything under the sun has already been said and done. You then open the place for a voyage an adventure of curiosity. You open a pathway to uh, places that human beings, uh, you know, in other cultures never stop thinking you could go. So, Army, this is me in the alleyway. We set these up in the alleyway at Homewood. It's an alleyway that used to call the Killing Fields because there were uh, anybody from Pittsburgh and no Homewood. And so they demolished, uh, they demolished most of the Killing Fields. They called it the Killing Fields because at the height of, of the crack epidemic the drug epidemic, and the war on drugs, um, people would cut holes in the wall on one side of the alleyway. And they were alleyway facing houses. The front doors faced each other in the alleyway. So if you read John Edward Whiteman's Homewood trilogy, he talks about you know walking the alleyway doorways and stuff. And, and like here, there, they take place all around these streets. They were cut holes in one side and hide bodies in them, and the other side they cut holes so they could run from the police through the buildings. All of this, I only found out I'm not from Homewood, I'm from Los Angeles, I live in Homewood for a reason. Um, my presence in my neighborhood is intentional and strategic, and I'll tell you about that. Um, I grew up in LA. I found out about the killing fields and cutting holes in the walls when Rachel Maddow show came to Pittsburgh and did two entire episodes in Homewood. And the episodes are called Homewood, America's Most Dangerous Neighborhood. And I was like, Rachel, you couldn't have thought of something more honest. Um, but our representative walked with her and showed her the houses that had yet to be demolished, so you can find that also. So um, the fact that I'm setting up I Come to Do Violence to the Lie in Formosa Way, in the alleyway, is um, is intentional. It took intention and strategy to create environments where um, you know it, racism is intentional and strategic, and so it must take intention and strategy and creativity to undo that. And so the figures are in this alleyway. This is just nine of them together. This is an installation. And they were sort of on a field of gold. Uh, we, anybody ever tried to bring earth into a, into a <laughs> museum? I don't like that. Everything that we just saw and every word that I just said to me is love. Uh, it is the 
great power that we have inside our love for ourselves. Um, I call myself a citizen artist, and my favorite part of the definition of citizen is inhabitant. I think about how I am most thoroughly and courageously going to inhabit my humanity. This bee on my front porch in Homewood. I stopped making figures that are this small and I started making them life size, a little larger than life size. They were not able to fit in my basement. I was working in like a damp Pittsburgh basement, so I started to work on my front porch, live in an intersection where there's a bus stop, so kids would, uh, kids, parents, people would stand at the bus stop and lean on my fence and they would watch me work. Um, adults were always scared. People um, would ask me, do you go to church? <laughs> do you go to church? Is that you? Adults would always tell me how scary the figures were. They'd say, why are they so black? And one woman, she said that to me, and I said, you know, you're a, a black woman, and you just asked me why the figure is so black. Um, and I actually don't have enough time to unpack that with you right now. Um, <laughs> I really said that, and I said, but you should think about that. Uh, so kids would watch me work, and kids would always look at me and they'd say, why are you so dirty? Because you know like how in the hood, like what you, like I'm not in that, okay, I'm not, excuse me, but how like we're a, 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 a celebratory materialistic culture. We reward and celebrate the material uh, shine. And so I was always, you know, like you wear your work. I'm always doing this, and I'm always doing this, and I'm doing wear it. And I didn't care about my hair, and that was a big deal to these kids. They were like, why are you so dirty? And I'd say, because I'm working. They were like, that's work, that's not work. That's why I was like, well, it's work for me. And then they would eventually get to the place where they'd say, can I help you? And I would say no. I said no a lot because in addition to being asked if I went to church, I was living with my girlfriend and one of the grandmothers in the alleyway told one of the kids that my girlfriend was not my sister or my cousin. And so the kids would stand in my gift, in my fence, they'd be like, who's Miss Michelle? My grandma said she's not your sister or your cousin. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And grandma said you don't go to church. So they had equated the woman not going to church with this other great curiosity. And so I would say, no, you can't come into the yard. And they would, um, and uh, what had eventually happened is a couple of the other kids said, Miss Michelle's her family. And I found out, I thought they were siblings, but they weren't. Their mothers are in a relationship. So they were taught to say, we're family. She's family. So that, they were like, Miss Michelle's her family. And I was like, that's the answer. We're family. And then what would happen is, because I would still say no, because you know, like I didn't want people to think I was ruining kids. Because everybody thinks you're gonna make somebody gay. Like older people think that you, you're trying to like just sprinkle gay on people. Like, <laughs> it's like faggot fairy dust. <laughs> and so they were like, so I didn't want people to think that. So I was like, you can't come here. And so what Zoe did was she would swing. You know, I could swing on gates. She would swing on the gate and she threw herself in my front yard. She was like, oh, I landed. <laughs> and she really did this. It was so clever. She goes, I landed by this paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> and I paint your porch. And I looked at her and said, that's what you're doing. I said, you're already doing it. And I, and I looked at her and I said, I see what you're doing too. I know, I know you. Uh, and so I then pulled out. Um, well, also what you should know is I was, when I made Power for to Keep Me Alive, I was dead broke. My water hadn't been on for months. I would collect rainwater in a Home Depot bucket and pour it into my bathtub. Uh, so I wasn't planning to live. I wasn't paying bills. And one of the things that happened is uh, there's a, a dealer in Pittsburgh to see the Duchamp show at the Warhol, and I was at a party, and somebody said, you like that kid's work. And we went back to a computer, and he came to my house the next day, and he bought all six of the power figures that took me six months to make. He bought them all. 
for between three and five thousand dollars each, which changed my life because I never thought I'd have anything. Um, unfortunately, like the stain of like fearing dying when I was a kid, that never left me. Um, so I didn't think I'd have anything. And I asked somebody to help me at some point buy a house, and they didn't have faith that I would come up with my financial end. And it was this older um, white artist who um, I thought believed in me, and he backed out on the contract. And so I took a deep breath, and I called the foreclosure company, and I said, you know what? My financial partner backed out. I'm going to make you another offer. And I lowballed this foreclosure offer. And the guy said, you know what? I appreciate your honesty. And he countered at $400 more. And I bought a house for the price of one of my power figures. And I never thought I'd have any, I never, um, I just didn't know, you know? And so that's this house. But we didn't have a lot of money to fix it up, so then I would barter power, power figures for Home Depot gift cards. Like one guy bought a power figure, took me to Home Depot, and bought all the paint and all the flooring for my house. Because when you walked into the house, you could look from the kitchen out the roof, which is three flights of first floor, second floor, third floor, you could see the sky. And so I fixed it up little by little. Um, kids would start to come and make art on my front porch, but I didn't have art supplies for them. So she's painting on slate from the roof of the Keith Lady Top Billy Scraper piano lessons because they demolished that house. Couldn't get the piano out because it was a concert grand. They smashed it with a sledgehammer, and then the crane came in and took out the heart of the piano. So they took it out in pieces, but that slate came from that roof, so I would just give kids whatever. And they would come and they'd be, so I'd give them materials and they would do um, something that I stopped doing as a kid, which was asking what I was supposed to do. <laughs> they said, now that I have these questions, Ms. Vanessa, what do you want us to do? I said, nope, 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 nope. Remember I told you this is work for me. I said, you need to make a decision. And I just did this as quickly as I could, because I was like press, pushing on a deadline at this time. I said, make a decision. And start with the start with your favorite color, and decide why you're doing this. You're doing it because you want to feel good. You need to do a project for school. Just make a decision and choose a color. And they started to do that. And then I would go to I would work on my figures, and they would see their friends get off the school bus, and they would be like, "Hey, you want to come and make some art?" And they'd be like, "Go home and put on some play clothes." And come, you can come. Go bother Miss Vanessa, she's working. You can come, come on. So they would, and their friends would come. And uh, there was the first time that that happened, I saw a kid sitting next to another kid. And the one kid did what the other kids did the first time they came and said, What am I supposed to do? And I heard kids say, You need to make a decision. <laughs> and I was like, That's amazing. <laughs> And they told them almost word for word what I said. And so I was like, I started to see how often that would work. And so I would get kids who um, were really married to this idea of perfection. And they would start something and it wouldn't be exactly like they'd like and they would just toss the wood to the side. And I'm using like the spare wood, like this is just wood left over from the house, slate, they're painting on bricks. When a couple kids, came one day and they were painting my fence, and they were like, Miss Vanessa, can we paint your fence? And I was like, again, it's something that you're already in the act of doing. So <laughs> you gave yourself permission. Um, but they would be, some of the kids were tied up with perfection, and they would just throw things away and be like, it wasn't right. And I was like, well, you're an artist. You get to, you can decide what's right later. You can see what happens. Um, and they would, like, get mad at the piece of paper and rip it up, and they'd get mad at themselves. And so I started to tell kids, you need to trust yourself. And I would make them say it. I'd say, say I trust myself. And they'd say, I trust myself. I said, well, you have to say it like you mean it. I just wanted to see what happened. Mm -hmm. you know? But I was like, really, at some point, you need to let yourself be. And I said, Tr I trust myself. I trust myself. And I'd make them say it three times. I was on the porch one day. And this boy who had grown up in Georgia moved to home when he says, this one is, I want to paint the night sky with stars. And I said, okay, I can help you with that. And then he wanted to paint 
the same sky at different times of day. So I was like, that's a series. We work on that. I mean, God, one thing that he didn't like it. And one of the littlest kids on the porch said, Chris, you need to say I trust myself. And I hear her go, but I don't believe you when you say it. And she says, say it again. And he did. And I was like, oh, you know what's happening? For them, the same thing that happened to me. When I was down in my studio, I found this place because kids would come like after they did their homework and they would rush to my house and there'd be this first 20 minutes on the porch and kids would be working, working, working and be absolutely silent. Everybody would find a place and I would look around and I'd be like, this is amazing. People would, at the bus stop would be like, is this a daycare? And I'd be like, what I look like is a daycare. <laughs> this is not a daycare. And they're like, who are these kids? I said, they're my neighbors. And I said, well, what are they doing? I said, they're making art. I said, well, I said they're like, who are they? I said, they're artists. And then they would start taking pictures of it. And they were like, pictures would show up on Instagram. They started showing up in social media that, can you believe these kids are just at this lady's house making art? Um, but I remember those quiet, quiet moments. And I was like, they, they're they experiencing what I experienced. And why wouldn't they? And I thought to myself, that's, love would be an infectious thing. It would be able to replicate itself exponentially. I was like, OK, call it what it is. Good with it. Uh, so there was a crisis at this house. I followed the ambulance, all these kids, to the hospital because in the crisis, they just put all the kids in one ambulance and all of them are crying. And I was like, this is like super scary for them. And so I followed the ambulance to the hospital and over the course of four or five hours in the night, next to Ken came to get the kids. And the first question the social worker would ask is, have you ever been in handcuffs? And I've never been in handcuffs. Um, I've never been arrested. <laughs> if you'd never been arrested, there wasn't a judge who could waive your criminal record. So at the end of the night, they look at me and my girlfriend, they were like, can you take these kids? And I bought an old Pittsburgh Victorian house, a five bedroom house with beds in every room because I have five siblings. So I was like, yeah, I'll take them. So I get crisis custody of four kids. They come to my house at 11 o'clock at night and they make sure there's food in my refrigerator and that there were mattresses. And I get these kids. And then I call the low-income housing company that owned that house, and I invited the vice president of the company to my house. And she sat on my front porch, and somebody from PBS was following me at the time. And just, they were doing this little segment, and the filmmakers were there, and they were filming it. And I asked her, I said, can we use the house that the people just got put out of? And she turned to the producer, and she goes, turn off those cameras. And they turn off the cameras, and she goes, you can't use that. That's a HUD house. It's low income. There's a four-year waiting list. It's all these things. And it was Memorial Day weekend, a four-day weekend. She came back on um, the beginning of the week and called me. And she said, yeah, I can't stop thinking about that. You can use the house. You're going to have to keep it under the radar. And I was like, OK. She said, you can use it for three or four months. Um, I was like, that's cool. She dropped her kid off at soccer one day and standing next to this guy she recognizes. Turns out he's a regional director for HUD. And she says, you know, we have this house at home with this thing that's happening. And the HUD director goes, you know, you can't stop doing that. So we're just going to let it work. Keep doing it. And every month they would have a meeting to decide what was going to happen to the art house. And every single month that woman said they're keeping it. For two and a half years, she did it. She paid our utilities. And she insured the house and she made sure that we had that space. And I remember thinking about her. Um, and she's, they have a private jet. So she don't have to do this. And I thought to myself, that's courage. To sit around that boardroom meeting with all those people and meet their eyes every day. And she said, yep, they're keeping it. Next question. And moving on. And so got this house. And because uh, what, what happened is the art in the front yard would get rained on and the kids would be like, why is my art getting rained on? I'd be like, because it's raining. And they would sort of, <laughs> and it would hurt them. No, it wasn't really. I'd be like, this is sorry, what we have. And so she let us use the house. And I put art supplies in the house and got a couple tables. And it was really basic. Um, made it colorful. And then was challenged when uh, the day that this picture is taken, 
two days before, 15 minutes apart, two young men were killed at the top of the street, and the news knocked on my door, and they asked me if I was scared and if I could kill, still keep the art house open. And it was the first time I heard one of my neighbors say, I'm scared to come outside. And so I was like, oh, uh, this is how that thing starts. When people stop coming on their porches, they take their chairs and their benches off their porches. And they stop coming out outside in response to a single thing. It turns the switch. And so instead of not doing it, I did something that I called a pot love dinner. And I invited all 5,000 of our Facebook friends to join us and bring a dish and to come over, which the police said was totally irresponsible. So I was hiking and just like a lot of people. <laughs>
I don't think it's my work to try to act like I don't feel something or something. And I also find, so I love Kerry James Marshall's show Mastery, and if you look at his talk, Mastery, and he talks about the studio as an intellectual space and how important it was. Anybody seen that talk? He talked about how important it was um, as a black male painter within an art historical canon that's like, you know, the masters. You know, and he's like, so I'm thinking about all of these things in this space, the studio is an intellectual space, that you have to, we have to do that given the context of black bodies on this land. Um, I, I think that it is equally as important to hold the space for the truth that the studio is both an intellectual space and a space of mystery and a space of great love and a medicinal space. I think that there's ways that sometimes people devalue um, craft and making uh, for, its, uh, for its healing effects, but you know what, as far as I'm concerned, thank God scientists started coming out actively saying like three or four years ago, do whatever you can in your lifetime to heal the trauma that you have because you will pass it on to your children. That they started talking about trauma in a way that is like a public health issue. But then also science wonderfully has told us what happens to your physical body when you're making art. What happens to your blood pressure? What is happening to your nervous system? And how you are actively healing in the act. I was a part of one of those brain studies where they asked me to imagine a thing while I'm in the MRI machine watching what happens to my brain. Um, I spent a lot of time at Standing Rock. I started going to Standing Rock in August, and there's no Lakota word for art. But everybody's always making and holding the space and the respect and the sacred space for that. Uh, so then it is, in, it is intricately connected to every part of your humanity. It's not ever divorced. It is thoroughly enmeshed in your breath, in your waking life, from the moccasins on your feet to the fry bread that you eat. There was never a separation. There was never margin put on it. And that's how health was understood, right? And so I believe that the studio is both the intellectual space and that space of true being that you find um, that still exists in some indigenous communities, people who were never, um, never had the rupture from their connection to the earth. So a uh, piece I made after Mr. Jeff, somebody, so a couple of people were actually killed right in front of the art house, um, which was worse than the up the street because I also made these signs that say stop shooting, we love you, and they've gone around the world, people sending pictures of them in Tahrir Square, CNN is on my porch. You're the girl who does this. How do you feel about this? Um, but when that man was murdered, you know, I'm the one on the 911 call that you hear, like saying, like that's me. And so I would be there's like news footage of me just stumped, like, like how, what do I think? Like how do I feel? Like, have you ever been with somebody right after they violently died? Do you know how utterly still it is? I was like, I don't know how to answer this question, but what I found then after Mr. Jeff was murdered, somebody that we all knew, he had just gotten out of jail, um, and I was so, he got out of jail a couple months before, and I hadn't seen him on the street, and I was so glad I hadn't seen him on the street, because I was like, oh, that's good, he's doing something else, and then I saw him Friday, and he got killed on Sunday, and I wasn't gonna look at him, and he knocked at my car window, and he said, hey, Miss Vanessa, how you doing? And I didn't wanna look at him, because I knew that if he was there on the street, that he was like back on the street, and then he got killed. Um, the kids saw this thing happen, um, and their parents would tell them not to talk about it. Uh, and what started to happen is the boys were pouring out the blood where the blood was on the ground, and the other kids had thoroughly ingested the message that you're not supposed to talk about these things. So they would tell the other kids, you don't, you don't talk about that. And I would say, do you ever notice that when somebody tells you to stop crying, it doesn't actually make you want to stop crying? 
that it makes you feel bad about the thing that you're doing. It just makes you feel bad. And I said to make the feeling go away, like he actually has to say it. And, they, and then so what happened after Mr. Jackson was killed, and I was totally unprepared for it. I had to call my friend who's a child psychologist, and I was like, this thing is happening at the art house. I am not prepared. I do not know what to do. Um, the kids would line up, and they would each tell me the death story. And when, and they were very patient and tender with each other. They made sure every kid got the space and time that they needed to do it. And it was so beautiful and heartbreaking. And I would, some of the kids would say like, it's my turn, it's my turn. And seven, eight year olds would be like, no, let him finish. He deserves this time. And, and I told the kids and they were like, Mr. Vanessa, what do you do? And I said, well, sometimes I hold the thought in my head and in my heart and I let myself feel the thing while my hands are doing something else, while I'm, while I'm making and building. And, and so they all wanted to try that. And so I was like, so think about it and feel it while you're painting this. And so, but then they would take in a single file line, literally. Um, and then I also found people who thought that you just, that because we lived around certain things that we got used to it, and that was like just sort of cool and okay, and like that we had this extra organ in our bodies that you just like stuck the grief and you pushed and moved on. And I was like, that's not what's happening. I was like, real trauma is what's happening. And my friend, the child psychologist said that untreated trauma becomes depression and then becomes rage. And after about five years, they know this from brain scans, it becomes psychosis, which is evident uh, around me. And I said earlier that I live where I live for a reason. I live there um, because I wasn't, I was homeless. I wasn't living anywhere. I was just like staying with my girlfriends. Like I was that kind of girl I would date somebody and be like, so, <laughs> I'm gonna stay here. Um, got kicked out of the place, like walked the streets and I was, so I found a guy um, in Homewood and I knew that because of the depression I felt before, that I was gonna need to live in a place where I could live dimensionally. And dimensional living for me was that I needed to be able to be inspired. I needed to feel safe enough to feel. I didn't have to like hide my being and I could be on the bus line and I could afford it. So I found a guy who owned a building. I said, I'm an artist. I see that this place is pretty wrecked and I can work on it. I won't always be able to pay you your rent on time, but I'll be able to pay you. And he trusted that and I did all the stuff in the house myself and with one of my friends and I could live. I couldn't always pay the water bill, um, but I could live there and I was surrounded by and I lived across the street from the house where Billy Strayburn took piano lessons. Dinah Washington's aunt lived across the street. Tina Brewer, the only, like one of the people who got the Lifetime Achieve, Artist Achievement Awards from PCA, lived around the corner and always was like one of those women who always had a pot of something on a stove. And I would be hungry and I would come over and sit on her porch and she would give me a bowl of something. I didn't even have to say I was hungry. Um, but that was a place where I knew I could be safe and taken care of in the ways that meant I could save life. Like, I wasn't afraid of the gunshots and the stuff, because I, you know, grew up in Los Angeles, and it's, you know, you know, and it, that would not have kept me from there. So this work um, is, I did at a glass center residency, those are lead crystal tears, we blew. And my friend, who's a black gay male family therapist, cut off his dreadlocks, the dreadlocks that he had throughout his entire education from undergrad to his PhD. He cut them off, he gave them to me. We blew vessels for each and every one of them because I thought, gosh, your hair holds all of that information, all of that information, all of that power, all of that promise. So there's a vessel for every single one of his dreadlocks in this piece. Um, there is no they. I used to. I sat on my porch one day and I was like, uh, they should do something about all this violence. They should do something to make sure the kids are safe getting off the bus. And then all this stuff was hit me. There is no they. If you're gonna do something, do it yourself. It was uh, primary election season. I made signs that looked like political yard signs, except they said, stop shooting me, love you. Um, put them in, I was scared to be the first person to have it mine in my, in my yard. So I went to the senior citizen home because senior citizens are like, the senior citizen center, they're like curmudgeonly and loving at the same time. They'll be like, get off my lawn. I love you, baby. Come back for a cake tomorrow. You know? <laughs> and, they, and they don't throw any kind. They don't care anymore. So I was like, the seniors. I went to the senior citizen center. And I was like, oh, I have these signs.
like it was right before bingo, they were mad, and they were like, who is the girl taking that bingo time? And from the back of the hall, you heard somebody go, how much the signs cost? I said, they're free. And there was like a stampede of walkers and canes up to the front. <laughs> it really was. They didn't care what I said anymore. They were like canning right over me. And they took them all. And by the time school got out, all of them were out. That was lunchtime. By the time school got out, they had all, they were all over the neighborhood. Um, our house was Stop Shooting Me Love You signs in front of it. I started to also make signs that just said love. And I thought that I made the Stop Shooting Me Love You sign after a, a little boy named Marcus was killed in a park by my house. He was he was um, 18 months old and was in the arms of his aunt. And somebody went by and sprayed. And he got shot and killed. And I um, went to his funeral and remember thinking, that's the smallest casket I've ever seen. Um, but that if you know, sort of like test me, like if there's power and love, maybe somebody will see this sign and instead of turning left to do something that they'll never be able to undo, they'll think about, they'll, maybe their sister's eyes will flash in an instant and they'll think about how devastating it would be to her for something to happen. So I make signs also that say love and you are so beautiful. Cause I'm just like, I just wanna see what happens. I'm gonna start. I would, what I would do is make signs and put them all in the yard and tell people, hey, come pick them out of the yard like flowers. And people would, they'd just come and pick them out of the house, like out of the thing like flowers. And I'd drive around and I would see them all different places. The new art house is so beautiful and beauty matters. You know beauty is a wonderful force to use to disrupt things and to interrupt the momentum of things. So the new art house uh, is really beautiful and I bought it uh, I bought it after uh, a certain American museum acquired several of my sculptures. I bought a couple houses at the end of the block. And I was like, hallelujah. Um, yes, that's a man up there on the top of the house. So I bought these houses, um, knew that I wanted to make them really dazzling. Um, and so I put two color swatches on the house. One was butter yellow and one was this blue color. My neighbors stood on the porch. They were like, Mr. Desert, could you please choose the butter yellow color because the blue color hurts our eyes. And then I painted it the blue color and I saw a trio of my neighbors just standing on their porch doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but then they all came and helped. <laughs> that Mr. Greg, so what would happen is it's glass mosaic. You put the material out, people come. Because all it is, there's a bus stop here. It's one piece of glass at a time. That's why I say anybody can do it. Just take one thing at a time, you're going to make a picture. One shard at a time, you will put the thing back together. You will make a whole. This is Mr. Greg from up the street working on the piece. I made black Madonnas out of glass, and the little girls at the bus stop were like, who is that a picture of? And I said, you. <laughs> And they were like, how does that mean? I said, well, isn't it beautiful? No, I think, yeah. I'm like, well, aren't you beautiful? And so we went through this whole thing, and they're like, oh. And then the one little girl at the end of it, she goes, is it my brother, too? And I said, what do you think? And then the bus came, so we came. <laughs> <laughs> this is our house. This is what it looks like now. There's uh, this size mosaic, then stars and glass, and each star has a person's name. And I came out of the house one day, and there was this white man with a little boy on his shoulders, and he was pointing to a star, and he said, that's my grandma's star. Uh, we have dance parties at the end of the art house. That's what it looks like. Um, I will. I sing and dance a lot, and a little boy said, Miss Vanessa, you know you're always singing and dancing. And I said, I do actually know that. <laughs> I am always singing and dancing. He said, why do you do that? I thought that was an interesting question. I asked him, I said, are you not used to seeing happy adults? And he said, no, not really. I don't see a lot of happy adults. And I was like, oh, okay. I sing and dance, it makes me feel good. Uh, and I found that I was uh, meeting a lot of young people who weren't getting the opportunity to have a space to just be joyous and to be free and to be creative. Um, and so what I started to do was do like play some like hip hop music and do contemporary dance to it, which is really awkward. So I'd be like, I'm gonna dance for you. And then all the kids would come out and dance. And it was just a way to have the medicinal power of joy. Neil and Amarion. I make, when I have kids make small power figures, I ask them if they can make a work of art that has the power to do absolutely anything, what would it do? This little boy said it would make grandma set pure temper. I, there's always this moment when a parent comes into the art house and they're like, oh. And they start making something and they say, I forgot what this felt like. 
And whenever the door is open, see our house, anybody who come in. Every once in a while, I bring out all the black stuff and the kids dress up in it and I photograph them. This is the night Mr. Jeff got killed. Everything that you saw before that um, matters after this even more because trauma accumulates and it affects every single cell of your body. Uh, and when people act like the children and human beings are resilient, but, and we are resilient, we just have to have something to bounce to, to rise and reach to. Uh, for this, this kid was one of the kids I called the window breakers. They broke all the windows in my house. <laughs> but they kept seeing all the other kids and their friends coming into the art house, so they were like, they had to humble themselves deeply. <laughs> and he came, he was just me and him there that day. We're fixing up the house, and he worked for four hours on that star, and right as I'm taking this picture, this is what he said. He said, I can't believe I did that. I said, you did, and it's great. And then to prove it to him, I got some other adults from the street really quick, and I said, look at what Chad just did. And everybody oohed and all over it, and then his like little crew of boys who's walking down the street, just like, come here, look what I did, I did this, man. And I was like, you did, you did it. This is what happens when kids follow me around when I'm shooting the blacks, they start to take the props and just put them on. <laughs> That's Ra Ra, he wanted to make a crown.
it's just corny. Uh, I appropriate the copy of the 1877 copy of Black Beauty, the about the horse. Okay. And I paint black pinups on it. <laughs> and this is at the Heberson Museum in Syracuse right now. And um, <laughs> then this is the art house this week. This is the art house on Tuesday. And this is Sienna. And she came and I took this picture of her. And I showed her. I was like, this is a beautiful picture. And I showed it to everybody. The adults were like, that's a beautiful picture. At the end of the night, she whispers to me. She says, Miss Vanessa, do you have any more pictures of me? And I said, I think there's some around the house. And I showed her this one again. I said, it's beautiful, isn't it? She said, yeah. And I said, would you like me to take more pictures of you? And she said, yeah, she would. And this is the girl who came one day to the art house. And she said, and she was crying. And she said, they say that I'm ugly and that I smell like Africa at school. And I said, well, what do you know about Africa? And I gave her a globe. And I said, show me where Africa is. And she pointed to Greenland. <laughs> I said, first thing you need to know about Africa is that everything that shines comes from Africa. Um, yeah, I'll stop. This is just my, I wanted to show you some things that I was working on now. This was, this is from Standing Rock. This is the day I left and we got caught in a blizzard. So then we, I was stuck for an extra three days. Um, I will show you my friend. And this is from my install in New York. show you another at the in back of the garden we have at the back of the art house we have a big garden and this is the scene out the top window of my couch um, my studio is I bought a duplex my studio is the first floor this is just some fine young men outside of the patriot party for the new uh, Smithsonian in DC <laughs> I just said just stop because you're fine <laughs> and I told one and I said, please do thank your mother for me. Because <laughs> you ain't spent an ugly day in your life, young man. <laughs> uh, this is the sacred fire at Standing Rock. This is when the East Coast tribes came in. Uh, the New York, Connecticut tribes, all on a huge bus. And I took a picture of this young man because he's black, but also mashed me and speaks it. And all of them did. And it brought me to tears because I realized I was like, they have what so many of us want. They they know their tribe. And I sobbed later and they all understood. They were like, we understand, we understand, sister. When you drive into Standing Rock, um, people have like a very similar experience, which is once you come over the rise of the hill, uh, you start to cry. And they talk about how it just happens. So that land is where they say the world began, where the First Nation came from. And um, th it is, like, so you start to cry. This is my friend Moreno. This is the picture that went viral around the world. I had no idea it was him. So I've been going back and forth since August. I saw this picture on BuzzFeed after I had left camp. And I was like, after the video of the mercenaries letting the dogs bite people, which was, I couldn't believe. When you drive into camp, there's a huge sign that says, we are unarmed because the wounded knee incident happened in 1973. Y'all stop me at any time, because my time has been up since like 20 minutes ago. But, but I just want to tell you this. I, I want you to know what it was like, because I experienced something in Standing Rock that I would never experienced before. One was the way the mainstream media absolutely invents things. I, as a black skin, one, I never saw racism the way that I saw it from the hands of white women to native women. The way that they treated native women at the Walmart uh, stunned me instantly this year. I've never seen anything like it before. I was like, oh my God, you know the picture of the young girl going to integrate Little Rock High School? And there's a young black woman walking like this and she's in high school. 
and there's this frozen picture of a white woman leaning yes. forward to yes. spit on her. That's what it was like at Walmart. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, and then I saw something happen, and then instantly, like, tears came to my eyes, and I was like, what's happening? And the Native woman next to me, she goes, that's racism. And I was like, oh. I was like, I just had to, like, I hadn't, you know, I live where, I live in Seneca Nation ter territory, um, where, you know, if you drive up, up there, there's this park and the freeway says you are leaving the United States of America. <laughs> and I said that. <laughs> so I see this picture on BuzzFeed, and I paid, and, and so camp is so peaceful. And I couldn't believe that they were meeting that with violence. It was so peaceful. You would wake up at three o'clock in the morning, and you would always hear people praying and drumming, like young men, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, singing songs to the moon and praying. And I couldn't believe that from the first time I went to camp to three weeks later, there were mercenaries, military vehicles, and the newspaper, the Bismarck Tribune, was actively inventing stories. As a black skinned woman, I could drive to town and I could pick up supplies for things and not experience um, the slowdown that other people, and people were scared. Um, my neighbors wouldn't, they wouldn't go into town. So I would drive back and forth to town. Um, and I saw the Bismarck Tribune and they were reporting rapes at camp. They were reporting weapons, they were reporting drugs. I was like, I'm sorry, I was like, I was confused. I was like, what are they talking about? I was like, the, I was like, oh, they're making this up, declaring it as fact to support the governor calling a state of emergency and being able to call in the National Guard. And I was like, oh, this is actually happening. What happened at the Wounded Knee incident, it's happening. They're like inventing savages. And so that's my friend Moreno, and this is the actual screenshot that I got from BuzzFeed. And I had no idea that it was him because we camped together. This is his daughter. I take art supplies with me everywhere I go. I was painting by campfire light, and she comes next to me. And the kids there are not afraid at all. And when you drive to camp, the first thing that they say to you at the gate is, welcome home, relative. And she sidles up next to me, really close to me. And I was sort of like, is it OK with your parents that you get this close to strangers? And she looks up at me, and she goes, I love to paint. So I gave her my paints. This is his daughter. And this is Moreno. That's him. He's First Nation, not, not me. He's the feather holder. He's like the Barack Obama of his tribe. And they stick the dog on him after a pregnant woman fell in the overturned bulldozed earth. You see a video with Amy Goodman yelling, why are you letting the dog stick on them? What happened is, um, at the time, native bodies were not buried in the ground. They were on the piles raised up. And the historian came in and said, you, you know, you have to wait. You cannot use this earth yet, the pipeline company. Uh, and that exact spot of earth and you don't just believe what I'm saying, go back and look at the news. That's what they bulldoze. So as they see the bulldoze is coming, um, the men are holding security, so women start to run, and a pregnant woman steps over the overturned earth. And mind you, you can see bone fragments in the overturned earth. She stepped, and the turf earth was overturned, and the men started running when the women ran, and she twists and falls, and he's reaching for her, and that's when that young woman let the dog at him. The blood. When Amy Goodman, if you watch that Democracy Now thing, and they, she's saying, there's blood in the dog's mouth. Stop, stop. That's a pregnant woman's blood. And so this is Moreno coming in to camp one day. Um, this is the girl who led us on the evacuation drill. They found a spot in the river that's low enough that if the women held a child, we could evacuate camp if they raided it. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Camp is so peaceful. Why do we need to do this? 
and the woman I asked was a survivor of the wounded knee incident, and she goes, I said, do you really think we need to do this? Is this paranoid? And she said, yes, I do. And so there was this woman with a Lakota beauty tattoo um, who, uh, who led us there. And nobody was ever permitted to take photographs of that space and that spot. And it was a tree, and somebody had climbed up and tied a red uh, swath of fabric to the very top of the tree. Uh, I'm going to show you just one more Standing Rock picture. The day that I read about the rapes and the drugs and the guns at camp is the same day I took this photo. This is what camp was like. And then since then, and even this week, you know, even with what had just happened, the pipeline company is still there. They're tear gassing people this week. They ran over two people with snowmobiles. Um, I was on Backwater Bridge with the Women's Prayer March, and I couldn't believe that they were pointing M16s at us, and that they had all those things. I didn't, it, it's like such cognitive dissonance to see soldiers facing you. Um, but I believe in the power of community. I believe that it is a community that will rise up, that, that it is a community that will shift us to being people of the earth again, that it's not going to be one person, that there will be a movement of like-minded, different <coughs> colored people moving together. So at Standing Rock, if any of you know the prophecy that all nations will come together. And I was standing there, the day I gave the last thing I'm gonna say, Destiny, I appreciate you so much, I'm taking you to dinner. <laughs> Y'all gotta give it up for Destiny, because she, <laughs> But I got there the night that the Comanche Code Talkers, the, by the night before they were leaving, and the first thing they do is they say, go see the elders, the oldest woman there, and bring her a gift. And so I go to the Comanche bus. And they say the Comanche are rolling out at five in the morning. And it's five in the morning on the prairie, so I wake up early and I go to the bus and they say, you know, I'm here and I want to say thank you. And they looked at me and they go, thank you. Because they look at my skin and they go, you must have come a long way. <laughs> How long did you come? I said, 2,000 miles. They said, yeah, you came 2,000 miles? Ah, she came 2,000 miles! <laughs> she came 2,000 to stand with us and they would hold my hand and they would say thank you. And people thanked me so much. But as the Comanche bus rolled out all over camp, you would just hear people cry out. You would hear them go, ah! And then people would run to the road. And then you would like, just like pump their fists. And I'm standing next to a man. He goes, and he was crying. He goes, can you believe this? He's like, the Comanche are here with us. We are enemies. <laughs> we are supposed to be enemies. And he's crying and he's talking to me. And I feel like I should just shut up at camera. I'm like, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know how to make fried bread. I don't want to like disrespect you. <laughs> because it's a real feeling. And he goes, I never thought I would see this happen. And he like pumps and gives his tribes cry out as the Comanche roll out. And I was standing next to him and I was crying too. And there is like people cry a lot at that spot of earth and they talk about how important your tears are, the salt and the water together. Um, and it was a very uh, powerful experience. And um, there were mad fillers in. <laughs> so as I, I want to tell you from my heart, and as not the person who is just an artist first, but as another, and just as a human being here in the room with you, I want you to know that I truly appreciate your time and your attention. Um, and those of you who ask questions, I appreciate your questions. And I appreciate you um, holding the space for a really informal and sort of untraditional artist talk because really um, I think the beauty is that we are all here together. Mm -hmm. And so I honestly and sincerely thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. And I want everyone, um, I, I, I would like you to consider what courage is in your life and what courage is for you. And I would like to ask you um, to uh, be more courageous yeah. and to be creatively courageous and to do so without timidity, and to do so with as much boldness as you can muster. And I would pair that with also considering, asking you to consider um, what love and forgiveness are for you. And to consider those things boldly for yourself, and to move forth with them from this place as you rise up, uh, change.
change differently considering what an act of courage is going to be for you? Because for me, it's one thing. What is it going to be for you in the world that you live in? And, and how might you move also with that courage, with love and forgiveness in ways that are that for you? Okay? So I thank you again, and I appreciate you, and I everybody be safe. And if you're traveling to D.C., be very safe and be vigilant and make sure somebody knows where you are. Okay.